So we've been looking at the church and what is the church? What, who was the chief cornerstone? Who was the building? Who laid the foundations? And who is it built upon? And we learned that a church is not like any other organization in this world, but it was built upon Jesus Christ, not another man, but on the Son of God. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, the foundation is formed from the apostles and the prophets, and we build upon them. And when we look at the church as a whole and as a building, the Bible uses some very interesting adjectives to describe the building blocks. And what were, how does the Bible describe the building blocks or the stones that make up the church? Exactly. And the stones are built, are lively stones. So when we look at lively, why are these stones alive? What makes the stones of the church alive? Better question is who makes them alive is really what it comes down to. And that is the Holy Ghost. When we look at evangelism and reaching the lost, the Mormons, they got to go door by door by door. The Jehovah Witnesses, they got to go door to door to door. Why? Because they're recruiting. But when we go to tell somebody about Christ, yes, we are in Christ, the hands of God extended, but it's the Holy Ghost that's doing the work. He's the one that's dealing with them and bringing conviction upon them. He's the one that's supposed to be giving us the words to say to them. So the stones that make up the church are lively stones because it's supposed to be the Holy Ghost working through the stones to build the church and working through us to build the church. So now we're looking at some of the gifts that God has given to the church to help it grow. We're calling them Christ's gifts because we know that Christ gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and pastors and teachers. We've been primarily looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 28 in this section of the study where God has set some in the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, if we go back to Acts chapter 2, what kind of government was in place? Were there teachers? Were there helps? Were there governments? Why weren't there anything, why wasn't there any governments or anything like that in Acts chapter 2? Because they weren't needed yet. In Acts chapter 2, we have the day of Pentecost. We don't have pastors yet. We don't have teachers yet. At this point, it's hard to say if we even have any preachers because the one who preached on Acts chapter 2, last time we saw him, he was hiding behind a fire a little bit ago because of a little girl condemning him to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and he denies it. And then Jesus has to confront him about it. Are you going to deny me again? So we find Peter being a coward, but on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, something changes. If we would have taken the Peter that we've known before Acts chapter 2 and said, well, he's going to be the one to get up and preach on Pentecost, probably, like, probably nobody would have believed it. Peter spoke a big game, but he didn't have the actions to back it up. Not when the rubber met the road. But in Acts chapter 2, something changed. And we start seeing the real, I don't want to say the real formation of the church, but we see the government of the church slowly becoming, play, becoming coming into place. And we have Peter, Peter preaching. At this point in time, are there any real need that we see for deacons or any other parts of government? Apparently not, because at this point, there's really nothing rolling. It's not until Acts chapter 6 that we see the deacons coming into place. Now, we talked a little bit about church government last week. Deacons can be referred to as council members, bishops. Does it really make a difference? Does it really make a difference what we call them? No. No. If we, there's no mention of a deacon's aid in the Bible, but if... There are church, churches that have deacon's aides, or a deacon's assistant. Is there anything wrong with that biblically? 
No. The Bible is a specific order. Because when we look at the creation of the office of the deacon in Acts 6, there's one reason it, was, it came into existence. And that's that there was a need. The apostles couldn't do anything. So they got together and they called and formed the office of the deacon in Acts chapter 6. And the reason being, the Grecians were complaining. Nobody's visiting our widows. Nobody's ministering to them. And at this point, we've already said that there's a lot of people in the church at this point. Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, and 3,000 or 6,000 get saved. Then we go to the gate beautiful and the layman's leaping and jumping. They guesstimate that about another twelve to 13,000 people got saved. So we have a large church by this time. The 12 disciples, they can't do everything. And they're trying, but they realize that there's a need that we can't visit all the sick. We can't visit all the shut-ins. We can't visit all the widows. So we need help. So that's why the creation of the Office of Deacon came into existence. As we see in Acts chapter 6, there was a need. We are living in a day and age where there's a lot of people that all they want is a title. That's not what it's all about. If there's an office created, it's because it should be because there's a need. That something's not being met and we need more help. The old Chinese proverb, many hands make light work. You know, one person can't do everything. The pastor can't be in multiple positions at one time. He can't be over here, Sister God, with your family. If there's another, say, three other families in the church that have something going on, he can't be everywhere at one time. He can try to be, but then you spread yourself thin. So the office of the deacons was to help alleviate that burden. So if we have a church and it creates an office that we don't see anywhere in the Bible, is it unbiblical? No, because if there's a need that needs to be met, and there's other people that are eligible, that are qualified to make, meet the need. They come to church every Sunday. They're faithful. And if you need help, then you need help. Then we need to go a little bit forward. There's nothing unbiblical about that in any means. If we look at today's church and we look at the government, we would pretty much agree, for the most part, you have the apostle, the one who founds the church. He founds this church, moves on, founds another church. There are, there are such a thing that some may hold to and others may not, but it's known as apostolic authority. We see that established in the Apostle Paul. He went from place to place founding churches, but did he leave them on their own after he left? No. He wrote letters back to that leader of that church saying, this is what you need to do to get it right, or letters to that church. Hey, you have things that are, you're doing good, but you also have things that you need to improve on. Or you have a situation in your church, and this is how you need to deal with it. The Apostle Paul, even though he founded the church he, and moved on, he still kept in contact with those churches because he wanted to see them grow. He wanted to see them mature. That is what we call apostolic authority. We see what he wrote to the Corinthians about the issue they had going on, about the stepmother having um, relations with her stepson, that you need to put them out until they get it right. We see other writings, that, like he wrote the book of Philemon, to Philemon, I think it was Philemon's master telling him, yes, he's your servant, but in the eyes of Christ, he's just like you. He's no different. So, and I might have that a little bit different. Philemon might have been the master, one of us might have been the servant. But regardless, you have instruction that in Christ you are one. You should not treat him any less than you want to treat yourself, even though he realizes as a servant this is his role as well. So we have Paul constantly going back and forth. That is what we call apostolic authority. Then you have the pastor. Then you have the deacon, the council members, the bishops, whatever you want to call them. And then you have the teachers. That seems to be the setup for today's day and age. Or something similar to that. Now, let's look at the office of deacon. If someone would please read Acts chapter 6, 4 through 7. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. And if you just want to keep your fingers in Acts chapter 6, we're going to be there for a few points. If 
someone would please read Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. Why don't I go ahead and read that because I, now that I'm thinking about it, there's some weird names that pop out. I'm not afraid to push them up and the more I think about it, people might be holding off because of the names. That's all right. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. Sometimes I'm a little slow. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples together. Take notice to that. Then the twelve. So we don't have more than twelve leaders. We have the main twelve. Called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out amongst you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then, and the saying does please the multitude, the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they sent before the apostles, and when they had prayed and laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So here we find the creation of the office of the deacon. And we go back and regurgitate what we I just said here. Why was the office of the deacon created? It's right there in verse number one. Why was the office of the um, deacon created in the first place? It wasn't just enough for the disciples, the needs weren't being met. And that's what it came down to. And like in every church, there's always those murmurers and complainers. Doesn't matter which church you go to. As long as there's people in the church, the church isn't going to be perfect. And if you think the church is perfect, you might then be the one making it imperfect. But regardless, no church is perfect. That's, and on a side note, that's why we don't come to church for people. That's why we don't come to church for who's being the pastor. The church you attend ought to be the best church in the area. And that's why you attend it. But if you don't go to church because somebody's there, then you have a hard problem. Because when it comes down to it, we don't come to church for people. We don't come to church because of this person or that person. And we don't stay home because of this person or that person. We should all come with one intent, and that is to get a hold of God. That what makes this church and not just an organizational another meeting. But we find that there was murmurings in the church among the Grecians. And the Hebrews. And when we look at this, it appears that there weren't really any position besides apostle or pastor, whatever they would have gone by. Because the Bible just mentions that the twelve came together. At this point, we have roughly sixteen to 18,000 people in the church. And twelve people being the head. There's no way twelve people can manage reaching all the sick, all the shut-ins. I mean, it's just absolutely impossible when you start looking at statistics. So we have murmurings. You know, well, they didn't come visit my mom. They didn't come visit my dad. My dad was in the hospital for six weeks, and he didn't come. Nobody showed up. Twelve can't do everything, especially when you have that size of a congregation. So the need arose. So they created the office of the deacons and the bishop. Now, part of the reason was these six were to minister to the, sh uh, the shut-ins, to the sick. But what were the apostles, pastors, whatever you want to call them at this point, what, were, what was supposed to be their main duty? The Bible mentions it. They started saying about it in verse 2. What was the role of the office of uh, the pastor, the apostle, whatever they would have been 
title was at this time. The Bible refers to it as the twelve. And the word of God. Well, in verse six, that's not what's mentioned. I'm just, sorry, Sister Don. Fully for specifics. It, it not for the pastor or the apostle. That was the office of the deacon. That's what they were supposed to do. If we go back to verse two. The twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Basically, the twelve were saying, We should be studying the Bible. We should be finding out what it means. We should be in prayer. We should be wholeheartedly dedicated to the word of God and the ministering of it. And in our day and age, they should be given wholeheartedly to praying studying the Word of God, reading it, and ministering. Getting behind the pulpit, preaching, teaching, whatever it would be. If they're now visiting the sick all the time, they, where are they going to find time to do this? So the office of the deacon was created so the deacons could go out and visit the sick and the shut-ins, and the pastors, apostles, whatever you want to call the twelve at this time, so they could give themselves wholly to studying the Word and to ministering the Word of God. <coughs> That is the, why the office of the deacon was created. Now we do find the importance of the office of the deacon in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 13. If someone would please read that. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 13. 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 13. This is a true saying, if a man the office of a bishop, um, verse 1 and 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. When we look at the office of the deacon, it's probably the most detailed office that we have requirements for in the Word of God. There's not much said of the requirements of the pastor. Yes, I realize as we go through the Word of God, we study, we can see the great shepherd. We can go to Psalm 23. We can do comparisons. But if we're going to go that somebody took time and just sat down and laid it out, da, 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 and went down point from point to point to point, there's no other office that I can think of in the entire Bible that is laid out in detail like the office of the bishop. And we're not going to read it or the office of the deacon, council member, whatever you want to call it. And that's laid out in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 13. You can see all the requirements of the deacon listed right in that and there. But when we look at it, the Bible is clear that he that seeks the office of being a deacon, council member, bishop, whatever you want to call it, that they seek a good work. And when we're talking about it, they make sure to go in detail that these are the requirements that's needed. They must be of a good report. And they that seek it, seek for a good reward. And when we look at the office of deacon, once again, I want to go back and reiterate. Reiterate, there's a lot of people that want a position just because they want the title. Or they want to be seen. They want to be the head. When we look at the ministry, when we look at the work of God, that really should not be the case at all. But rather, we, are not, we don't do it seeking a title, seeking recognition, but we do it because exactly as Acts chapter 6, there's a need. No one else is fulfilling the need, and we're saying, Lord, use me. And that's what it comes down to. But we have the requirements of the deacon laid out in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 13. And believe it or not, during the time of the Apostle Paul, there were deaconesses. There were women that were deacons. Now, you're not necessarily going to find that laid out in the Word of God, but it takes a little bit of study. It's, if, it's not spiritual. No, brother, it's very spiritual. Because uh, they cannot be the, the husband of, of a wife. But it is very scriptural, brother. It really is. Yeah, but it's not, it's not in the Word of God. It is, brother, and I'm about to take you there and show you that. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1. Romans 16 and verse 1. And we can see it in Romans 16 and verse 27. 
Romans 16 and verse 1. If someone would please read that. I commend you and Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centura. And then if we read verse 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And then if we go down, it should be in the... In 16.1, one we're getting there, brother. But if you study out Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, when we get to Phoebe, it says, I commend you unto Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant. If you study out that word servant, it is the exact same Greek word that is used to describe a deacon. It comes from the Greek word diakonos and means probably an obstacle to run an errand, an attendant, a waiter, specifically a Christian teacher and pastor, technically a deacon or deaconess. Deacon, minister, servant. Now if you want to turn to Appendix D, if you have that from last week, that's where we're primary, that's where we're going off of at this point. Now, Phoebe was given the title of the servant of the church. Now, when we look at that Greek word for servant in Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, it is diaconus. It occurs 31 times in 29 verses in the New Testament. There's only eight times in the entire New Testament when that Greek word has been translated literally servant. But all the other times it is deacon, deaconess, not deaconess, deacon or deacons. 18 times the translators translated the word diaconess as the word ministers, three times as the word deacons. The translators only used the word servants in place of diaconess in the books of Matthew, Mark, John, and Romans. All the other books that contain the Greek words diaconess was translated using the word ministers or deacons. It is also important to know that everything, every time that Paul used the Greek word diaconus, and this is the Apostle Paul in his writings, the translated, translator translated it either ministers or deacons. Only twice out of the 23 times that Paul used the word, it was translated it servant. So when we study it in more detail and apply it to the word of God, it appears more likely that Phoebe wasn't just a servant, but she was truly a deaconess. So, but then I come to catch what uh, Paul said in Timothy. It, what, does, what do you mean by that, brother? Because in, in here it says about the deacon being the husband of one wife. And a woman cannot be unless, she, unless she's a lesbian. But when we study the Word of God and we study it in a word detail, it looks like more likely Phoebe was truly a deaconess. And you wouldn't know that without actually studying it out. And why would it say in Timothy that a man would have of one wife? He was laying out the office, yes, brother. But when you still study it out, signs still point that Phoebe was a deaconess. So when we move on from there and start talking about today's lesson, we're going to begin looking about those that have diverse tongues. So the diversities of tongues. So we're going to spend the last 15 minutes looking at that. So when we look at 1 Corinthians 12, 28, the last thing mentioned is the diversity of tongues. The tongue is extremely important. Even the book of James informs us of the importance of the tongue. It says that it's a mighty member. It compares it to a rudder, how a small thing can turn such a great big ship. Now, the tongue is extremely important for us as Christians because if we go back to Adam and Eve in the garden, how many moral languages were there? And I'm not talking the male side and the female.
female side. But how many languages were there that they communicated with? There was one. If we go to the time of Noah, how many languages did they communicate with? with one. If we go a little past Noah, during the construction, construction of the Tower of Babel, how many were there? Or prior just to before the construction of Babel? How many languages were there? There's still just one. So where did all the languages of the world come from? The Tower of Babel. Why did all the languages come into existence in the first place? Because they were against God and he confused their tongue. Exactly. Now, when we look at the Tower of Babel and the situation going on there, the whole purpose of the tower was because God created a flood and man said, you know what? This is never going to happen to us again. And if you start studying out the Tower of Babel, it's not that they wanted to reach it build a tower that reached all the way into heaven itself, but they wanted to build it into the heavens, the sky, the atmosphere, just above where the water line was before. So if God did send a flood, they would kind of stand on the platform and go, no, 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 you, know, you can't touch me. And that's what it was all about. They wanted to get just a little bit higher, and God said this was never going to happen again. So God came down and confused the language. There's another extremely important aspect of this. God told them to do something after the flood. And what did he tell them to do? He told them to vamoose, scatter, go abroad. And they said, ah, we ain't going to do this. And they got themselves to one spot, one location against God. So God came down and confused their language because of their rebellion. And they, basically what it comes down to is God took away the common tongue, the understandable tongue, the universal tongue. Because if it's one thing that I hate when I go into a foreign country that I don't speak the language, it's that stupid language barrier. I can deal with cultural differences. I can deal, not, I mean, I always want to eat everything they're eating. <laughs> I, when we were in Panama, somebody ordered fish at the restaurant, and I saw the whole thing come out with head and eyes, and it's like, you know what, I like fish, but I don't want to go there. But it wasn't the appetite or the different eating stops that really got me, it was the language. I can't communicate. That's the one that gets me every single time. But God did that for a reason. God took away the common tongue, and it brought division amongst men. Because if you can't communicate, there's no going back and forth. And if you can't go back and forth with them, then we might as well do what God told us to do in the first place and go and separate ourselves into the different parts of the world after the flood. And that's exactly what happened. But, at Pentecost, it was different. <coughs> there were people in the upper room, room that they had different dialects. They spoke different language. But there was a universal language that they all could communicate with. Otherwise, why were they all in the same location? There had to be communication. But God came down and he used that tongue with the diversities of tongue to unite his church and bring men together. So it's through the tongue that God split the people up and divided them throughout the world because of rebellion. But when it comes to obedience, God used the tongue to bring men together. And he used it as a sign that he's real and that there's none like him. Because what astounded every man in the upper room was he heard somebody speaking in his own dialect. Yes, there might have been a common tongue, but their native tongue at home they also heard somebody else that they knew didn't speak it, speaking that language. So God broke down and came down through the common tongue, through man's tongue, and united the church. Now, if we look at the Greek word for diversities, it is geno. And it means kin, concrete, liber uh, or liberal or figurative, individual or collective, born, countrymen, diversities, generation, kind, nation, offspring, or stock. When we, and the Greek word was used in 21 verses of the New Testament. And it was translated, and you have all the different words that it was translated into. The Greek words for tongues is glossia, 
or if we want to go a little bit farther, it's added on. It's the same root as we get glossalia, the speaking in other tongues. And it is, by implication, a language, the tongue, one naturally unacquired. Not naturally acquired, but naturally unacquired. And it occurs in 41 verses of the New Testament. And you have all the words that it was translated into tongue, tongues, with tongues. But basically, it all centers around the human tongue. Now, in the last 10 minutes, last 7 minutes, we're going to take a quick look and a quick open discussion on what is the difference between between tongues and the gift of tongues. So I'm asking you, what is the difference between tongues and the gift of tongues? Well, what is tongues? Well, if we get down to it, tongues is basically that prayer language that God has given you once you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is not the gift of tongues, but it's your own prayer language that God gives you to speak with Him. The gift of tongues is something completely different. The gift of tongues is used in a church service or a gathering, and it has a specific purpose. The gift of tongues is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. Just because you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you pray in tongues does not mean that you have the gift of tongues. If you are not careful when we're studying the Word of God, the two can get mixed up really easily. It's a matter of separating and realizing what the difference is. So tongues is the prayer language that we receive when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The gift of tongues is meant for so much more. Now, when we're talking about our prayer language in tongues, or it can be applied to even the gift of tongues, when tongues is given forth, there are two types of tongues. The Apostle Paul mentions them. There are the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. There are, if the gift of tongues is being used, you may not know what language it is. And nine times out of ten, you probably won't know what language it is. It could be Indian, as in Bombay. It could be Navajo. It could be French. It could be Spanish. But it's an unknown language to you. There have been times when the gift of tongues has been used in a church service, and there's no interpretation. But there was somebody in the congregation that spoke that language and knew exactly what it was and had the interpretation because God was dealing with their heart. Now, when somebody speaks in tongues, who does it edify? Who is being built up? Not the church, because the gift of tongues is not an understandable. What I mean by that is, brother, you're, like, you're using tongues, or I'm using the gift of tongues. Nobody here may know what it means just the tongue itself. So at that point, it's just edifying us. Whoever is the speaker, the tongue is edifying them. Now, if there's an interpretation, then it's for everybody because there's understanding involved now. Because when it comes to tongues, tongues edifies the individual that speaks it. We get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4. If someone would please read that. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. So we have the division right here of who edifies. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, he edifies himself. Because God's using him, God's blessing him, but it doesn't edify everybody else because we have no idea what's being mentioned. We have no idea what God's really being, uh, is trying to bring forth through the tongue. But when tongues is given, it uses prophesies, but we could also throw um, interpretation in tongues in there too, because basically they're the same thing. Prophecy is there's no tongues, basically um, interpretation, there was a tongue, and now it has to be interpreted. When the interpretation comes forth, when somebody prophesies without a tongue, then the whole body is edified because 
Now we know what God's trying to say to us. So, the person who speaks the tongues is edified. Now, in closing, who is the gift of tongues for? The Bible's a little bit more specific on who the gift of tongues is for, or who it's meant for. If we get to, do you still have 1 Corinthians 4, um, 14? Nope. Does somebody else have 1 Corinthians 14, 22? 1 Corinthians 14, 22. So, I have it wrong in your notes. The gift of tongues is for the unbeliever to show them that God is real. Because we don't need any sign that, to prove that God is real. We know that. But when we get to the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues is for the unbeliever. Now, with everything being said and done, does anybody have any thoughts, any comments, anything they'd like to add at this point as we come to a close? If not, let us bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns one high and that there is none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we can see you move like never before. Lord, that we may have you minister to us like never before, Lord. That we may receive your word with gladness, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we apply it to our lives, that we may be even farther transformed into your very image. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen.